I mean, how did I find myself in this situation? I'm on the brink of failing out of high school. The young lady that I'm dating at the time tells me that now she has a baby on the way. And then to make a bad situation worse, I just got fired from my job. <laughs> like, there's no way that this can be happening to me. Like, this, this has to be a dream. So I rolled back over, and of course, I went back to sleep. Only just a few hours to awake later, and then I realized that that dream, that dream was my real life nightmare. But hold on, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me slow it down, let me rewind, let me not get too worked up. Sometimes I have that tendency. Let me take a deep breath. Everybody do it with me. Ah, so much more refreshing. So it was my senior year in high school, and I was the man on campus. Well, okay, okay. A few people knew my name. And then I was getting my college plans in place, and I had to finish the year out strong. So then I would just head to the local grocery store. This is where I worked at the time, and this was my safe haven. They loved me here. And I was just on my register, checking them out. Boop. Boop, boop. Hi, how are you? Oh, you smell terrific. I'll see you next week. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, yes, ma'am. And then my manager approached me and she said, Jonathan, do you mind if I have a quick, just a quick word with you? And I asked her, well, what is this about? She said, Jonathan, just turn off your light. They want to see you upstairs. And something just told me deep in my spirit that this wasn't going to go according to plan. But I honored her request. I made my way around my register. And then I began to pass by my friends over at customer service. And we were all like this one big family. And we would laugh and we would joke. But today, today nothing was funny. And have you ever been in a space, in a situation where it seems like everyone else around you knows some deep, dark secret and you're odd man or odd woman out? Everybody say yes. So then I just slid on by and I began to make my way up the stairs. And before I could make it to the top, I was met by a sharply dressed gentleman I've never seen before in my life. He said, Jonathan, please have a seat. He was very sharply dressed. Blue suit, white shirt, blue tie. Real presidential-like. He said, Jonathan, my name is Bob. I'm with Lost Prevention. Do you know what we do? I said, well, Bob, I mean, I'm not really the best at guessing games. But if I had to assume, I'm going to say that you help prevent loss. He said, <laughs> very good, Jonathan, very good. No one really gets that on the first try. I said, well, okay. He said, my next question for you is, do you know why you're here? And it was almost as if in that moment, in that instant, that I had amnesia. I said, Bob, I have no clue. I don't know why you brought me here. I don't know why you took me off my register. I don't know what's going on. He said, okay, Jonathan, that's fine. Okay, I'll give you that one. He said, my last question for you. Are you familiar with the term of sliding groceries? I said, Bob, over two because I definitely don't know what this one meant. He said, Jonathan, well, sliding groceries is you passing groceries over your register without the intent to scan them. And as I just sat there and stared at Bob with a dumbfounded look on my face, and I began to see almost like a movie reel playing in my head in slow motion, and I began to see the friends who would call me and text me of all hours of the night, just trying to coordinate a meeting point and a meeting time to where they can come and maybe get some chicken wings. Or another time where somebody says, John, you remember that one time where I helped you out and you didn't have a ride from school and I picked you up and I took you where you need to go. So can you, you know, make this thing happen for me to where I come in and I pick it up and I don't really pay anything? And then there was a point where it got so bad to where friends would come to my house the night before, I would go to work and they would slide money in my mailbox. 
And then as I'm looking at Bob and he continues to ask questions and interrogate me and to pick and to pry to the point where I just say, Bob, wait. As the guilt rose up and it forced me to speak out, I said, I'm guilty. I said, I slid those groceries. He said, Jonathan, thank you for your honesty. You can go home. You're no longer needed for the day. You've been relieved. And as I hung my head and I took that long, lonely walk of shame, still seeing my friends at customer service, but I tried to rush out and hide my face because I was embarrassed. Have you ever had an incident where you got into a little bit of trouble and you knew that your integrity was telling you to go the right way, but still you, for some reason, took a turn? Then I was in the place where I hopped in my car and I said, okay, let me just go home. Today's going to be over. This is all just a terrible dream. It'll end. Let me just make it home. Then I will be fine. I'll just be able to go to sleep. And it's done. And just before I arrived home, the calls and the texts, John, where are you? Where have you been? What happened? Everybody is so nosy all of a sudden because they want to be in my business. And my girlfriend at the time, she called me and I finally answered the phone. I said, hello, what is it? She said, John, I need to see you. And I said, no, not, not today. Can we just talk about this tomorrow? Can this wait just tomorrow? Just give, me, just give me a little bit of time. I just got fired from work. I'm not trying to think about anything or anyone. It's nothing personal. Just leave me alone. She said, John, first I was asking you. Now I'm telling you. And ladies, this is when she dropped this phrase on me. And I wasn't ready for it, to say the least. Those heavy four words. She said, John, we need to talk. In five minutes flat, I was in my car and I pulled up in her driveway. Before I could even really park, she met me face front. And I was like, what is it? And I can tell that she was exhausted because her eyes were bloodshot. I could tell that she was crying. And seeing the bags under her eyes because it was almost as if she was carrying this weight of this secret. And I was like, what is it? Please just let me know. Just tell me. She said, John, I don't even know how to tell you this. I said, please just tell me. She said, John, I'm she began to cry. She said, I'm pregnant. I said, oh. I just embraced her, and we just sat there for a moment. But during that time, that was when I realized that my dreams of going off to school, leaving Georgia, coming to Texas, and going to get my college degree, that crashed. Me going, playing Division I basketball, living out my hoop dreams, finally, that vanished. Because now I'm having to position myself to not only provide for a family, but taking on the responsibility of providing for a child. This was all bad. Have you ever been in a place to where you had one of those terrible, horrible, no good, very bad days. Everybody say yes. So after we had this conversation, I hopped in my car, and then I began to drive home, and I'm like, okay, this is it. I'm, I'm done. And now this is when one of those individuals where we might call our friends because they just hang around, but this is our friend named Adversity. And Adversity began to bang on my door. Boom, 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 boom. John, what are you going to do now? How are you going to take care of this situation? How are you going to provide? What's next? Don't worry, John. Nothing's next because this is the part where you crumble. This is the part where the story's over. No happy ending. Say bye-bye. And I said, adversity, I don't want to play today. I dove in my bed. I pulled the cover over my head, and I just put my face in the pillow. And then as days, days turn to weeks. The weeks turn to months, and now I'm just trying to figure out, what do I do? 
Now I'm thinking, dropping out of high school, this became a real reality for me. Leaving, just getting a job somewhere. Because knowing that I just lost my previous one, I'm going to have to do something to generate some form of revenue. Then early one morning, I, as I began to roll over, excuse me, hello? Hello? Wait, what? What happened? Hello? Hello? And in that instant, she just let me know that she would no longer be having the child and she just suffered a miscarriage. I didn't know what to say to console her. I, I couldn't even conjure up the words together to find a way to help remedy the situation because it was tragic. The loss of a child? And some of you might say, John, what's the point of that story, John? Why are you sharing that with us here? Because I was carrying that shame and I was carrying that guilt and it was so heavy. My mom and my dad never even heard this story. Because I felt that there were people out there that would judge me. I felt that I'd be ridiculed. There was a point I even felt so unlovable. Have you ever felt to where you hit rock bottom and then you couldn't even see an ounce of daylight? You were almost to the point of where you were swimming in a sea of darkness and you couldn't even see the sun. But according to cognitive psychologist Jerome Bumer, he says that we're 22 times more likely to retain information and facts when they're shared within a story. And the beautiful thing about stories is sometimes we laugh together with stories, and other times we cry. But stories are all around us. Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, NBC, ABC, CBS. Stories surround us on a daily basis if they're political, if they're about religious beliefs, or even maybe Kanye West recording a Christmas album. Christian album, oh my goodness. <laughs> But friends, I want you all to understand that today I don't want anyone else to be in a position to where they're a prisoner of their own story. Each and every one of you in here, your story has value. Your successes, your scars, your failures, they all make up our stories. Because there's too many people who we see on a daily basis, we say hi, we say bye, but we don't take the time to really connect with people with social media in our face and all this screen time here and there, and we don't even get to see people and connect on a heart level anymore. But when we began to share our stories, and then we began to put ourselves in circles with friends, now we're able to take time and get to know one another and help heal from the inside out. Because I believe that each and every one of our stories are a prescription for someone else's pain. So today, my friends, I'm not here to dare you to stand behind a podium and share your story. I'm not even going to dare you to step in this extremely large red circle and proclaim your message. But the circle of friends that each of you all have, they need to hear your story. Because by you sharing your story now, you allow them to be freed from that bondage, from that shame, from that guilt. Because when you began to share your struggles and your flaws and those things that might have hindered you, then somebody else says, me too. I was in that situation also. And now you're able to put them in a place to where they can see that they can yield a certain level of success for their lives as well. So, friends, today I want you to understand that there's no greater pain and there's no greater agony than bearing that of an untold story, Dr. Maya Angelou once said. So today I charge you all to share your story.
My name is Jonathan Jones. Thank you.